Hi and welcome to this instrument walkthrough for Percussion Untamed which is a really interesting percussion library based off the solo strings untamed uh, recording sessions. Basically at the end of each one of those recording sessions what we did is we spent some time recording percussive sounds from the instruments themselves so sort of like tapping violins and knocking violas and scratching cellos and thumping double basses lots of like you know interesting percussive sounds that would complement the solo strings untamed series mainly because it's the same performers and the same instruments in the same space but also we went in with that same kind of philosophy as like make these sounds sound human so we kind of like only went with that idea of like you can only use your hands or the bow itself we didn't want sort of like you know drumsticks used or anything like that it was like you know try and get as much contact human contact with the instrument as possible uh, so we've got 40 sounds mapped across the keyboard most of them uh, almost all of them are three dynamic layers with six round robins and there's some really interesting stuff in there which I'll take you through in a minute uh, once we did the basic instrument we then sent it across to a really great percussionist really great drummer and a really great film composer to come up with some unique loops that you can use in your own compositions so we've got 220 loops uh, to play with uh, based across 60 different style sets which I'll explain soon uh, with with various different time signatures as well they're not all just in 4-4 four, four. they're across some you know the, the the most useful time signatures that you'll come across uh, and they're they're midi loops as well so they'll beat syncable there's no sort of artifacts with time stretching or anything like that they're really great human loops that you can use but also like once you've got that MIDI data into your door and you can start to play with it then you can start to manipulate it and, and, and make those loops a bit more of your bit more of your own style. So let's go to the individual hits first so you get an idea of what those all sound like and then I'll take you through how the loops work and how those are set out and kind of like what you can do with them. So onto the hits and how they're mapped across the keyboard, you've got these different coloured groups which are very loosely based, uh, you know, sounds. Some of them you might think belong in others and others you might belong in others, but this is the way we've grouped them anyway. So the yellow, you've got these like bass sounds, much more bass drum sounds. That's one of my favorites. That's the, the bow going across the tailpiece of a double bass. When Sam the bassist came up with that uh, sound, I was like, I've never heard that before and I never even thought you'd be able to make that tailpiece resonate, resonate, but that's what that sound is. Really useful sound, really interesting sound. So onto these orange notes, which are more like hitting sounds. It's much more with like the palm of the hand and the, and the base of the fist. So again, a bit more, a bit more higher register, still sort of like fairly bassy, but a bit more uh, click in there on some of those sounds. Then you've got these green notes, which are knocking sounds. So it's much more with like the knuckles uh, this time. That sound is like the, the, the tail end of a, a bow actually hitting the uh, fingerboard. So onto this blue section next, which is much more higher pitched, like tapping metallic sounds. Uh, it's like hitting some of the uh, tuning pegs and like the, the foot rest that comes out of the bottom of the cello. That's a, a piece of metal. So we were hitting the tail end of the bow with that to get like this metallic sound. And then onto this uh, pink section, which is much more the experimental sounds. And when we were recording these, I was like, I'm not sure how useful these are going to be. And even when it was coming to develop it, I was like, OK, let's, let's keep them in because they're interesting. But I couldn't figure out a way in my head how they would actually fit into a, like a percussion instrument. But then when we gave them across to the people to make the loops, what they've come back with is some really, you know, interesting ways that these have been used. So I'll just take you through some of these now.
I mean, some of these are more like sound effects and percussion sounds, so it kind of like crosses the realm into like sound design and things like that, but useful nonetheless. This one's one of my favorites. You got these like little sweeping sound effects, like like brushing across the strings, uh, and those are really good. They've got a slightly slower one and a slightly faster one. So you can hear there's some stuff there that you're not going to use all the time, but just accenting uh, some of your loops or some of your like uh, rhythmical sections, they can be really useful. And then you've got this orangey red section at the end which are looped swishing sounds. So a bit like the circular bowing that you've got on some of the other instruments, they're kind of like continuous like motion sounds. So with each one of these sounds, you can tune them, pan them, and change the volume of each one of those sounds individually and exclusively from the others as well. So it's just a case of hitting the sound that you want. And that's really useful to be able to tune those percussion sounds uh, just to get some different variations out of them. But also like some of those sounds have got a bit of a pitch to them. So just to be able to bring that pitch in line with your own composition. So maybe it's, you know, you, you actually bring it to like a D flat or like a C sharp or, you know, whatever pitch that you're working to in your composition, just to make the, the, the rhythmical elements tie in with the actual melodic elements is a really useful thing to do. So you can see there that it's remembering the, you know, the, the value that you've placed on each one. Uh, the tuning is kind of like plus or minus a full octave, so you can get really deep with some of these. Starting to sound a bit more unnatural, but you know, for, for certain compositions that's gonna work uh, really, really well. As a top tip for these, if you wanna get a bit more precise control, if you hold down shift on your keyboard, that knob will suddenly become a lot slower to operate and a lot more precise. And that works with any control on any contact instrument, if you didn't know that. If you wanted to get some really precise control, hold down shift, and then the, the, the sensitivity of that knob becomes a lot slower. You can reset them as well by holding uh, command uh, on your keyboard and then left clicking and then you've also got this reset all so if you've been playing around and like tuning every single one and you just want to get back to kind of like you know default and you don't want to have to go through each sound you can just hit reset all and that brings you back right to the beginning. Uh, you've got two microphone positions to play with the spot microphone and the close microphone so if I just give you the spot first Very dry, hardly any reverb to that at all. You can't hear much of the, the room sound at all. And then the close mic is a stereo microphone pair this time. Much more lively, much more of the room sound. Uh, but blended both together, you know, they sound they sound good. And when I take you through the loops, you'll see how I've changed the microphones to change the sound of the of the rhythm. Uh, then you've got these loops. So uh, to explain, you've got these different sets up here to choose from, different time signatures to choose from. So three, four, 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 five, four, six, eight, and seven, eight, each with their own different sets underneath. For four, four, you've got way more, obviously, because that's much more of a popular time signature than you have for like six, eight. Uh, but you've got over 220 different loops within each of those. So if I choose four, four to begin with, let's just choose uh, set seven. And then what you do is you can trigger four different loops from within each set that get more complex as you go on. And that's what these red keys are down here for. So if you hit uh, C1 down here, Uh, 
and they're four bar loops. So they're kind of, you know, it's not just one bar that repeats itself. There is some natural development within those four bars as well. And then C sharp brings in a slightly more uh, complicated one. And then D. So that's much more of a standard sound. And then D sharp brings you uh, the, the, you know, the most complex loop within that set. So the easiest way to get these into your composition and just start using them straight away in your own work is just to draw the notes that trigger the MIDI loops into your door. So you've got C1, which is the minimal sort of like style loop. And you've got C sharp one, which is like the more uh, simple loop. Uh, D1, which is the standard feeling and then D sharp one which is the more complex uh, one of the rhythm and as long as those are all quantized to your music they will play with no effort at all. So you can see there, it's really quick just to start using them immediately. And then if you wanted to change the style set, you weren't keen on that one, you can just change that set uh, and then, you know, see what that sounds like. And these are tempo synced as well, because it's MIDI data, there's going to be no artifacts with like, you know, time stretching samples or anything. It's triggering the samples, you know, under the hood of the engine. So you're not going to get any, uh, you know, strange artifacts. Just increase the tempo, work with whatever tempo you want. If I just increase it to 130, it's going to work absolutely fine as well. Uh, and then you've got these humanized options as well. I mean, these have been, you know, performed and played by real people. So my advice is not to quantize them, is just to leave them exactly as they are and not to snap anything to the grid because you'll start to lose the feeling that's been naturally performed in these rhythms. Uh, you know, one of our other briefs was like, you know, make it as human as possible, play it in with pads and, and, and actual, you know, like drum triggers rather than like programming it in, you know, using your keyboard. Now with these, you know, just triggering the normal loops, you can humanize it even more with these wheels here. So you've got velocity, and timing as well. If you just wanted to play it exactly as the, you know it was performed in the first place, just bring these down to absolute bare minimum and that's how it would have been performed originally. You've also got this link option as well if you just wanted to bring them both up at the same time. Uh, so that's that. And then if you wanted to really customize these, this is where you know it starts to get really exciting is just to drag the, the raw MIDI data into your door to customize it completely to your own tastes. So if you just trigger the, the loop that you're interested in, so I've still got 4-4, set 30 and minimal. If I now just drag that MIDI loop straight into your door, then you can see there the MIDI data appears immediately. And if I didn't like that note, for example, I could bring it up to one of these, or down here, and then change this one. And then you can start to obviously still change the sound effect. So this one's triggering on B, and tune it. Tune this one up here. Pan it across a little bit.
And then if I like the others, you know, I want to carry on that after I bring the uh, complex loop in next, you'll be able to see that the two loops are there. And then maybe I want to just take the standard one across here as well. And then you'll see all of those loops playing together. And then that's where you can really start to, you know, like fine tune those compositions and make those loops into your own sort of like more, you know, more of your own style. Uh, and I would say like, you know, people are saying, you know, are, are loops cheating in your, in your work? And I would say, well, to a certain extent, some people you just need to get up and running. Like you've got a tight deadline to work with. You just need something that works and is gonna, you know, fit with your composition and you'll be able to find something in there easily that's gonna work. And the other thing I would say is that like, if you brought in a, your own percussionist to record something or like to make their own loops, then that wouldn't be cheating because, you know, essentially you're hiring somebody else to do your job. You know, can you come up with a percussion sort of section for my composition? And this is, you know, this is how I feel about them is, you know, these are real people that have recorded these and performed these. So it's just kind of like, you know, we've already taken that stage away from you is like, you want somebody else that's much better at percussion to to come up with a loop that's suitable for your work, well, that's what's here. So I would say that loops aren't cheating as long as you turn them into your own thing and make them fit your composition. Don't just use them necessarily straight out of the box. You know, make sure that they, they fit your composition and that they're suitable for your music. But I would say they're not cheating. They're no more cheating than bringing another musician in and saying, can you write a part for my own work? That's how I feel about it anyway. Uh, so with that said, let's just change some of these uh, settings here. You've got a EQ, saturation and compressor, which are all fairly self-explanatory, but the compressor is really good. If you just want something to work quickly, you don't want to have to open up another compressor. This is a parallel compression uh, effect that just adds more and more compression, dials in, mixes more, in, more compression in as you turn it up. So they can, it sounds more visceral and more alive and more in your face and a bit more epic as well uh, to use that compressor. You've got the same sort of like reverb uh, settings and everything else that's on the other instruments so you can put them all in the same space. So what I've done here is basically pulled out a few of the uh, sets uh, from the instrument so you can hear kind of like some of them uh, on their own and what I've done is already just played with some of the EQ settings and compression settings reverb settings microphone settings tuning all that kind of stuff just so you get an idea of like the variation uh, that's included with these so this first one is a 4 by 4 loop and this is set 9 all of them playing from you know the 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 very basic loop all the way up to the most complex loop This is four by four set four.
and you're hearing that one, some of those scrubbing sound effects at the top, that I was like, where are they ever gonna fit in a percussion instrument? But then, you know, these percussionists and drummers have taken those sounds and kind of like worked them in as like, okay, yeah, they really, really fit and really, really work. Uh, this is set 19, let's just take it down to 120 beats per minute for this one. that lost all reverb setting, loads of reverb, really deep and bassy. Brings out a lot of those low end frequencies that reverb setting does. Uh, so this is uh, the final four by four that I'm gonna show you, which is set 24. So now I'll show you some of these other time signatures that aren't 4-4. Four, four. We've got 3-4, set 2 uh, first. Uh, and then one of the 5-4 versions, this is set one. Really cool, again, that swishing sound effect just to bring an extra layer of texture in at the top there as some of those sort of like more experimental sounds at the top just added every now and again just to keep your ears alive and interested is really cool. And then we've got a 6-8 one. This is set three from the 6-8s. Really nice, just those little tapping, repeating sounds on that last loop there, really nice to hear. Uh, and then the last rhythm I'm gonna show you is one that's in 7-8. This is set number five of the 7-8 time signature. Uh, and I was really pleased we did 7-8 because it's always a time signature I struggle a little bit with. You know, I've been told to internalize it, you know, counting four, then three, or three, then four. Uh, and I always like hearing it because it's such an exciting time signature because you, your kind of brain's expecting eight beats, but it's getting seven. It's kind of like leaping ahead of itself all the time. And that's why it feels exciting because it's kind of like skipping that last beat and going on to the next one. But either way, like, you know, sometimes I can't always feel that rhythm internally. So it's great that you've got a set you know several sets of rhythms here even just to give you a kick start and to go okay that's the way I'm going to feel it anyway so this is set number five of seven eight
So yeah, that's one of the seven, eight ones. And I was, you know, like I say, I was really pleased that we've got those in there because I still struggle there. I was trying to count four, then three when I was listening to it back. And just having those loops, you know, performed by some really, you know, amazing percussionists and drummers is really good just to see what's available and what's, you know, what's achievable with these types of time signatures. And then you can just take parts of those rhythms and turn them into your own and just, you know, copy and paste certain little elements and, and make those loops even, you know, more your own individual sounds. So yes, maybe I'm just not a great composer and seven eight's not my time signature and I'll never get it. But having these loops has definitely helped me to kind of like try and feel them a lot more than I was doing before anyway. So that's it. If there's anything I've missed, as always, drop us a line in the comments and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Uh, really hope you enjoy this one. It is absolutely amazing uh, to play and just to get some really interesting sounds. And it is definitely such a great uh, instrument to go alongside the Solo Strings Untamed library be because it's it's the same instruments, it's the same performers, it's the same space, and it's the same sort of sound. And like I said, we went in it with the same philosophy as like, don't quantize these loops, don't make them perfect perform them like you would normally and the same with the sounds as well let's get some stuff in there that is interesting that is going to catch people out and 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 kind of make them think well that's just not a drum kit or like a normal percussion instrument that's something a little bit different uh so yeah i've been i've really enjoyed playing with it and i hope you'll see from the demo tracks is it, it fits quite a wide range of styles as well there's some stuff in there that is sort of like full-on epic thriller sort of music and a bit more like horror music as well as some stuff that's a bit more folksy, sort of like much more intimate sort of string quartets and those kind of things. So it blends equally well. Some of the big sounds at the bottom, the bass drum sounds sound great, but if you wanted to make them even more, I know we're saying it's not like, you know, an everyday Tycho library, but if you EQ them and put enough reverb on there, then you can make them sound absolutely huge uh, and epic. So if you wanted those kind of sounds out of this library, then you can absolutely do it. Uh, so that is it. Thanks very much for watching. Hope you're all well and we'll see you on the next one. Take care.